Good morning. Welcome. We're so glad you're joining us here for worship this morning, whether you're joining us in person on YouTube or at Greencroft. Again, we extend our welcome and glad you're able to be here to worship with us this morning. If you join me, we have a responsive psalm to share together. Out of our depths we cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of our heart's desire. If you, O Lord, kept track of all our wrongdoings, Lord, who could stand? 
but there is forgiveness with you, which is one reason we honor and praise you. We wait for you, Lord. Our souls wait. But in your word we hope. Our souls wait for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. As people of God, we hope in you, Lord, for with you there is steadfast love, and with you is great power to redeem. Let us pray. Dwell among us, God of presence. Dwell within us, God of peace. Strengthen us that we may be your witnesses in a world of strife and struggle. May we in word and action reflect your will for this world. May we as your ambassadors bless all who know us and all who meet us with the hope and peace of Jesus Christ. Speak to us this morning in our hearts and bless us with your word. Amen. Amen. This time we'll join together for our first song, number eight. This is the time we share our children's story for all the children that may be out there watching on their tablet, uh, phone, or computer, uh, and for you folks here as well. My story this morning comes from the book Small Wonders uh, by Kate Finney, uh, who uh, lives in Plymouth, and uh, it's published by Brethren Press, and we have permission to use those stories here in worship uh, uh, during this time. Well, one of the things we just did was pray, and prayer is a way we talk to God. Now, it doesn't matter what we pray. We can just kind of 
think and talk to God, but sometimes we want to have a little bit of a plan. Like if we're going to see a, a favorite uncle or aunt and we want to remember to thank them for something they sent us or ask how the dog is or things like that. Uh, so sometimes we have prayers we plan in advance. Now Kate suggests that one of the things we might do is pray. That is, uh, she gives us the initials P-R-A-Y with some suggestions. P is for praise. God has done amazing things for us. So we could thank God for the amazing things and praise God for being a great God. P is for praise. R is for repent. You know what? We've all said or done something we wish we hadn't have done. And sometimes we just have to say, I'm sorry. It doesn't hurt us to do that. R is for repent. A is for appreciate. Food the place we live, family, pets, stuff we have, thanks. We know that God is the source behind all giving. Even when we know something came to us from a friend or a parent, God gives us all things. So we appreciate what we have. The last one is maybe a word we don't always use. It's Yield, the letter Y. Yield is a strange word. The yield sign is at the road where we're supposed to let somebody else go first. A lot of times we think it's our turn right away. Jenny and I encountered this yesterday on the road over at the corner of uh, 38 and 119 where a couple of young people, after we started to go on out into the uh, uh, intersection, decided they were going to go anyway. And then they stopped and thought, oh, I'm going to go anyway, anyway. <laughs> so yeah. I thought something. I didn't do something. <laughs> so yield means go ahead and have your turn. Now, in our prayers, we recognize sometimes we yield because God knows best. And it means we trust God. And so we yield. <clears throat> Let me go over those again real fast. P. R. A. And then Y for yield. Now, one prayer that helps us to P-R-A-Y is the Lord's Prayer. And I, fortunately, I've got a lot of help here. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. This time we're going to share our scripture lessons from the Inclusive Bible. We have passages from 1 Kings and also from John. So starting in 1 Kings chapter 19. While he himself went a day's journey to the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Yahweh, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel of Yahweh touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there near his head, there near his head was a cake a bread baked over hot coals and a jar, jar of water. He ate the cake and drank the water and then lay down again. 
The angel of Yahweh came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank some more. Strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And then from John chapter 6, starting at verse 35. Jesus explained to them, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will be thirsty. The temple authorities started to grumble and protest because Jesus claimed, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They kept saying, Isn't this Jesus, son of Mary and Joseph? Don't we know his mother and father? How can he claim to have come down from heaven? Stop your grumbling, Jesus told them. No one can come to me unless drawn by Abba God, who sent me, and those I raise up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard God's word, has learned from it, comes to me. Not that anyone has seen Abba God, only the one who is from God has seen Abba God. The truth of the matter is, those who believe have eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, and if you eat it, you'll never die. I myself am the living bread come down from heaven. If any eat this bread, they will live forever. The bread I will give for the life of the world is my flesh.
I can't think of a more boring way to start a sermon than to say that I was listening to a podcast about Shakespeare's theater. (laughs) Take your time, fall asleep. And how important it is, it was in those times to engage all the senses. You know, sight, obviously, you have to see a play. And, and, and hearing, you want to hear the words. As a matter of fact, they used to talk about going to hear a play because the words were so important. But how about smell? How many of you, when you hear that a friend go, went to the theater, say, what did it smell like? Well... I learned in that podcast that smell was important, too, from something as simple as the smell of gunpowder and fireworks that might go off on stage uh, uh, to the fact that sometimes they used animal blood so that the people standing up in the front could smell the blood of the people that were having their head cut off. I was sharing that with with a very talented stage director, Jerry O'Boyle, And he reminded me of one of the most exciting scenes I've ever experienced attending the theater. Uh, There was, in 1997, the Round Barn Theater presented a musical called The Baker's Wife. The book for the musical was written by Joseph Stein, of course, played on the Joseph Stein stage. Joseph Stein, among other things, wrote Fiddler on the Roof and Plain and Fancy. Uh, And it's set in a little village in France. And when the baker dies in that village, it's a catastrophe. By the way, don't worry if you haven't heard of this musical. It won a lot of awards and critical acclaim and is a cult classic, but somehow it just never made the jump into the uh, canon of American musical theater. Anyway, uh, what is life without fresh bread? Uh, The people in the village want to know. Well, one of the very effective things that was done by the director was in about the fourth or fifth song of the musical, there is a new baker and there's bread. And the actors came on with freshly baked bread. I mean freshly baked. So you could smell the bread. Boy, I just thinking about the smell of fresh bread makes my stomach start to gurgle. Indeed, that's one of the reasons I've asked people during our Bread of Life series to to bring some bread for us to sample during uh, our fellowship time after worship is just to remind us how good it is. Anyway, great song, great bread, and when Jenny and I got home from the show, she baked five loaves of bread. I'd like to say that we saved some for later, but I can't. Anyway, oh, but we, when, when the first loaf came out, we broke it open, and, you know, you just smell it, and that just intensifies the experience. That's why, that's why I don't blame the folks who experienced the feeding of the multitudes when, when Jesus took a few loaves and fishes and miraculously made so much that there were 12 baskets of leftovers. That's why I don't blame them for following Jesus when he crossed the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee by boat, and they either crossed by boat or walked around or whatever. They followed him to get some more. Because I don't know about you, but my first thought after finishing a sourdough roll is how do I get another one. Bread, bread, no matter how you slice it, is addictive. Now, butter or honey is fine, and butter and honey are fine too, but I don't need either one of those in order to enjoy it. Now, in the, my last message on the sixth chapter of John and the bread of life, I told how the people followed Jesus looking for more of that bread. And they pointed out to Jesus, Moses gave the people manna in the wilderness every day. So the implication is obviously you could do this again uh, and again 
and again. Now, Jesus had reminded them, no, it was God, not Moses, who sent the bread from heaven. And that uh, uh, he, he was trying to turn their attention then beyond the physical bread to the living bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone that beholds the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. I've tried to emphasize during these messages, but I'll say it again. In the Gospel of John, you either get it or you don't. You either get it or you don't. The Samaritan woman at the well, when she hears that that this living water would never run dry, is thinking, the people in the village don't like me. I come to the well alone instead of socially with the other women at the break of day. I come in the hottest part of the day. If I had a bucket that never ran dry, I would never have to face the humiliation of not belonging to my own community. But when she hears Jesus talk about himself as the water of life, she's able to make that jump, jump to be transformed, and not only herself to be transformed by Jesus, but her whole village. They were able to say, before, we only knew this because you told us. Now we know it for ourselves. They had come to know Jesus, too. As I pointed out, Nicodemus bogged down at the image of being born again, which also means to be born from above. But Although at first he's puzzled, eventually he gets it because by the middle of the Gospel of John, he stands up for Jesus even though it means being humiliated by the other members of the council. And later, when Jesus is being taken down from the cross, he sets aside his dignity and lugs around a 70-pound bag of spices for his burial because he will be there for Jesus when he is needed. And... Elsewhere in the gospel, when Jesus heals the man born blind, who not only regains his sight, but sees Jesus for who he is, he is transformed. Whereas those who criticize Jesus for having done this miracle on the Sabbath are blind themselves. They don't get it. So the dialogue between Jesus and those who were present at the feeding of the multitudes continues to deteriorate because That bread is on their mind or it's in their stomach gurgling even though they haven't gotten it yet. Jesus reminds them that the manna did not give eternal life. Those people in the desert grumbled about how life was better when they were slaves and they all died in the wilderness. Jesus wants them to look past their desire for free bread towards what he really means by the bread of life so that they might never die. Their response is just to get personal. Isn't this the son of Joseph? Don't we know his father and mother? How can he say that he came out of heaven? Isn't that that what we do in the world nowadays? Instead of addressing real issues, we just get personal. And we get mean. They don't get it. But Jesus gets it. He says, why are you grumbling with each other? And he picks a word that calls to mind the grumbling in the desert. The Greek word is gangusmas, which I love because it sounds like people grumbling. Gangusmas. It doesn't have to make sense. Grumbles don't make sense because they proceed out of a deep place of, of frustration, want, desire, anger. And when... When we, uh, when we grumble, when we grumble, we lose touch with reality and people can't get through to us. Well, Jesus, in response to this question, don't we know his father? Don't we know his father and mother? Why does he say he came out of heaven? He, he does the smart thing, which is hard, hard for us. He doesn't address the unimportant stuff. He doesn't address his origins on a human level, he addresses the spiritual question. Just as bread gives life, Jesus gives life. Jesus was sent by God from God. He tries to get the conversation back on track because if you go ahead and argue whatever issue it is 
On the level that people want you to argue, it'll be for nothing. My sister-in-law, Nancy, has a little poster or a little sampler on her wall. It says, never wrestle with a pig in the mud. You'll both get filthy, and the pig likes it. God is drawing us in if we can see past our grumbles. And the default setting is love. You're going to have to dig in your heels to keep love out of your heart. You're going to have to dig in your heels to keep Jesus out of your heart. You're going to have to grumble enough that you keep the pleading of your sisters and brothers and your Savior out of your heart. Resist putting people in a box. That's the first thing. They put people in a box. They put Jesus in a box. Don't we know his father? Don't we know his father and mother? Just because I know who you were and where you went to school doesn't mean I necessarily know who you are. You are more than just the daughter or son of human parents. So certainly that has greatly affected who we are. You are the bread of life for somebody else. Whether you know it or not, somebody needs what you have to offer desperately. You are a gift from heaven for somebody. Besides, knowing somebody's human history, their ancestry, doesn't predetermine who you are. You know, there's this, this saying which is not true. The fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Now, that may be true about fruit, although... Nature counts on animals and birds moving some of those seeds a good distance. But as Christians, we believe that fruit sprouts legs and runs. We are not necessarily prisoners of our biology, our ancestry, our environment, the things that do affect us, because we can be transformed. Most of all, the family of God doesn't stretch out behind us it's ahead of us. The family of God is forming. The future is the true measure of our past. What we are becoming is who we are. <sighs> now, I don't want to discount the importance of bread. In the other scripture read this morning, poor Elijah, when Jezebel is out to get him, is spiritually out of gas. He's been on the run. He's ready to give up. I might as well die. So before God recommissions him and speaks to him on the mountaintop, he sends an angel with bread and water and tells him to eat not once but twice. So don't, don't discount the importance of seeing that people are fed first before we move on. Jesus certainly fed the people first. We are, after all, a community of bread. This morning, I noticed we were collecting more for the frozen food ministry. And remember, that food isn't just for people who don't have food. It's for people who need to know somebody cares about them right now when they're having a tough time, when they're ready to give up too. We break bread in the love feast. We run into the, each other at the restaurant by accident and invite people to sit down. <coughs> we tell each other, hey, we got to get together for dinner, and sometimes we actually do it. Just as yeast transforms flour and water into something living and growing and life-giving, so too Jesus, the bread of life, transforms us into a living, breathing community, and with that breath, we pray with each other and for each other. We bless each other. We share the Holy Spirit who lives and moves and breathes among us. And the nice thing when it comes to bread, that works for tortillas too, and pita bread and flat bread and every other kind of bread there is because we include all people. As Paul told the Athenians when he was speaking on Mars Hill that uh, he was willing to use some of their pagan poets making it scripture by saying, uh, for, for as it said in a pagan poet's a poem, in him we live and move and have our being, 
And even as some of your own poets have said, we too are his offspring. We are all God's offspring. We are all God's people. Take hold of the life that is real life. Amen. Our sermon hymn is number 516, Just As I Am Without One Plea. in our time of offering, I'll share our offering statement. In our time of offering, we recognize not only what we offer to God, but what God has offered to us. There are some things offered to all of us, the rain, the wind, the sun, and the seasons. There's the beauty of the earth, which we sometimes take for granted. There are also the gifts God directs towards us personally, comfort, support, encouragement, as well as occasional pangs of conscience and sometimes sharp reminders that we are not on the right path. Let us give thanks and praise not only because we are able to give, but also because we are privileged to receive. Let's go before God in prayer. We receive your gifts during this time of offering and give you thanks personally and as the body believers for all that you have given us. Please receive our gifts as well and guide us in their use for your ministries in this suffering world. This we pray in your mighty name. Amen. And now for our benediction. Sisters and brothers, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us. <laughs>